These are my thoughts on a Sunday meeting from 2021 that I wanted to share for some time now. I'm thankful that I finally found the time to record this for you. My apologies that it's such old light being from last year. It still represents so much of what the Watchtower teaches though, so I think it's still relevant. Last year I logged on to a Watchtower Zoom meeting and listened to what they had to say. I've done this a number of times, but this particular one really caught my attention because of how funny it sounded. I laughed out loud multiple times, especially during the Q&A. I can't share the actual meeting with you, but I can share my thoughts on some of the more audacious comments that were made in the meeting. The speaker started off by talking about people searching for something to help them in life, of course hinting that the org is the true answer. First he starts with why the Bible is so valuable and even how its old age actually lends it credibility. I found that particularly interesting from a group that always talks about the light getting brighter as an excuse to ignore all of the org's older teachings as if they don't matter because they're old. But if you really do believe that teaching is less relevant or worth looking into the older it is, wouldn't that make the Bible basically meaningless to them because of its age? I also noticed how sad it is that he was talking about the Bible telling you what you can do to be happy. No mention of the fallen, sinful state of humanity and the need for forgiveness, reconciliation, and salvation. He talks about the Bible more as a how-to book. Then he gets into a history slash science lesson about splitting the atom and then tries to tie it into a verse in Isaiah because of the word energy. Contextually, they don't relate. But I can imagine the way that he so mind-numbingly presents it. Most JWs are probably only half paying attention and wouldn't take the time to really consider whether these two things have anything to do with each other. Further, if you look up Isaiah 40:26, you may notice that the word energy isn't actually there. It's another paraphrase added in by the Watchtower writers, not any kind of accurate translation of the original languages. What Isaiah is actually talking about here is the greatness of Jehovah's might, not his vast dynamic energy, as they put it. And the way this speaker uses the language even makes it sound like Jehovah himself is a creation consisting of energy. You may have noticed in some of my conversations with JWs, they often refer to Jehovah as a spirit creature. I know that's more of a slip up caused by the kind of language they're trained to use, but it does kind of fit, doesn't it? Their Jehovah sounds a lot more like some kind of created being than the creator of the universe, doesn't he? Now, don't get me wrong. He's trying to use all of this long-winded meandering to suggest that the Bible is scientifically accurate, and I agree that it is. For instance, yes, the Bible does tell us the earth is a sphere, which it is. But his whole argument here that he's trying to weave together is really pretty pathetic in my opinion. Honestly, it sounded like filler. He's not really saying anything, just throwing together various dates and passages and occasional scientific wording, none of which have much to do with one another. I haven't bothered to look up all of the dates for various scientific discoveries he mentions because it's just going to take more time than I have. I'm going to assume that they're at least mostly correct, but I can't say for sure that they are. They do get dates wrong an awful lot. This makes me sad because I can see how this kind of garbage would lead the majority of XJWs to mistrust and basically throw out the Bible, usually continuing to believe that how the Watchtower uses it in their teachings probably is true to the actual text when clearly it's not. Everything I hear this guy doing may well veil the eyes of many followers from seeing what the Bible actually says. And far too often that continues to be the case even once they've been freed from the org. 
He then gets into a long presentation on the rise and fall of the Greek Empire and how it's prophesied in Daniel 8. Again, I agree that all Bible prophecy is true. But how they twist that to put themselves in there as if they're the fulfillment of Bible prophecy is just an age-old farce that's been done by many others and will likely continue to be done by many more in the future. For instance, taking a parable in Matthew 24 and claiming it's a prophecy about themselves. It breaks my heart how many JWs fall for this tactic. Why do they believe this? Where in the Bible do we find parables as actually prophecies? And what makes these eight men in New York the fulfillment of this supposed prophecy? Because they say so? I can't ever seem to get a real answer from JWs. In fact, they seem to get frustrated and not want to talk with me anymore when I ask them about it. Then he, of course, jumps right over to Matthew 24, and he uses that to start getting into Watchtower's famous newspaper eschatology. He doesn't really dig into the passage, of course, but gets into talk about bad things that will happen near the end. I have heard JWs admit that much of what Jesus was talking about here was specifically about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But Watchtower likes for them to focus instead on doom and gloom in our present day to get everyone afraid and looking for some kind of savior organization to help them out of it. And then he jumps right to 1914, which is such an important date for them. They say that it's a fulfillment of prophecy because it was the beginning of World War I. But Russell wasn't predicting the beginning of a big war. In fact, people were already talking about war coming soon. It wasn't some random thing that suddenly happened and no one was expecting it. What Russell was actually predicting was the end of Armageddon, not the beginning of a war. He also came up with a date by calculating from 607 BC which is a date he conjured up using pyramidology to say that it's when Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed. This isn't some weird conspiracy theory. It's well documented in his own writings. Problem is, the temple was not destroyed in 607 BC. It was in 587-586 BC. It is only the watchtower that continues to use the date 607. Actual history tells us the real dates. But they didn't work for Russell's calculations for his prophecy. So even to this day, they still hang on to 607 BC and 1914 AD as an important part of their foundations. From there, he gets into the Spanish flu and various other viruses through the years, of course, eventually landing on the current flu and how scary it is. More fear tactics to prove that we're for sure in the last days. Don't get me wrong, if you personally do believe we're in the last days, that's fine. But for Christians, we don't live in fear because of that. Our hope is in Christ, and we trust in His sovereignty, His purposes, and His care for us always. We don't need a magazine publishing company to save us. Nor do we use fear to manipulate people into joining a church or anything like that. Next comes the bragging about all the field service they're doing, whether in person, online, over the phone, or whatever. I've noticed that they do this often. Start with fear tactics and then jump over to boasting. As I've come to expect, he then jumps over to Watchtower's promise of so-called Paradise Earth and references Revelation 21. I've noticed he kept using the word recreation, though it's nowhere in there. I'm thinking this is to reinforce their novel idea that people cease to exist when they die and then are recreated from Jehovah's memory on the new paradise earth. I do understand that they wouldn't want to focus on the word resurrection because the actual meaning of the word doesn't fit with Watchtower teaching, and they wouldn't want their followers looking into or considering that too much. It might get them to start, you know, waking up. They had to redefine the word resurrection for JWs, which is something I've noticed they often do, like with words like generation and Christendom, for example. Interestingly, if you really look into what they say Paradise Earth is, you find that it's not really paradise at all and doesn't really look like 
how Revelation 21 describes the new heavens and the new earth. For instance, there will still be sin and death according to the watchtower because of free will. And then at the very end, a whole bunch of people will decide to follow Satan, even if they faithfully continued going door to door, proclaiming the org's teaching and leading watchtower studies for the thousand years. So what they're looking forward to is a very long stretch of time that they have to use every day to prove their loyalty and earn Jehovah's friendship and approval. Contrary to what Revelation 21 says, they believe that the Lord will be separate from them, up in heaven with the literal 144,000 JWs that they will never see again. He won't be on the earth with his people. And worse, the poor 144,000 have a horrible future that JWs themselves are told they would never want, just serving as government officials forever separated from their friends and family. Does any of that sound like paradise to you? In fact, when the Bible mentions paradise, it's actually always talking about heaven. And why is that? Because to be with the Lord is true paradise, isn't it? Then he switches over to more pragmatism and why Ephesians 5 and 6 give such good advice about how the family should live. Yes, it is good advice, but note how his presentation of it is completely stripped from the gospel, which Paul tells us is the most important thing. And then he jumps over to bragging about there being 8 million JWs in the world, suggesting that they're a great nation in perfect unity who never fight with each other and all that. That's the pride promotion again, to keep their followers puffed up and loyal to the org. Then he proclaims, let the Bible guide you to happiness and life. He's still trying to use the Bible as a how-to book. Then he finishes up and they go on to sing song number 122 titled, Be Steadfast and Immovable. If you're not familiar with this one, it's a pragmatic song about being steadfast and work, work, work for the org. Okay. We'll close this one out for today, and in the next video, we'll move into the question and answer part of the meeting. I just wanted to give you guys a quick update about my health situation. First of all, thank you very much for the prayers, for all of you that have been praying, and for the kind notes that you guys have been sending me. I really appreciate it. Uh, my health is still a struggle, and there's a long way to go with a lot of tests and a lot of doctor's appointments. and. Uh, just a lot of challenges ahead still, but uh, we press forward and we continue to pray and trust in the Lord for his care all the way through. So again, thank you very much.